A, B, C. Easy as one, two, three. Hey, we got a really cool math show today, man. A, B, C. Yeah, but it's the one, two, threes. Oh, the one, two, threes. Up next on the Edge of Tech Guy. Yeah. You're listening to the Edge of Tech Guys. EdutechGuys.com. Listen to us now. We're going to make lyrics for the song. <laughs> I, I, I think I said this on another one. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> hey, thanks for tuning in to the Edgy Tech Guys. I'm David Henderson. And that this is the idiot on the other side of the table, Jeff Madlock. Yeah, hey, again, thanks so much for tuning in, turning on, downloading, grabbing the episode, subscribing if, if you do. If you don't, please do. Hey, yeah, check out our all of our social medias. Just look up Edgy Tech Guys, E-D-U-T-E-C-H-G-U-Y-S. Jeff likes to act like he can spell fast, and so, you know. <laughs> Every day I'm standing in front of the mirror going, E-D-U-T-E-C-H-G-U-Y-S, I'm a spelling fool. You are. It reminds me of that meme that's going around of the kid, the teacher's like, uh, how do you spell crocodile? And he's like, K-R-K-O-D-I-L. And she's like, that is not correct. He said, you didn't ask me to spell it correct. You said, how did I spell <laughs> <laughs> That's you spelling uh, EduTech guys. <laughs> yeah. So you find us out there on the web, edutechguys.com. Edutech Tom. Guys. There we go. Tom Shoes. Great for <laughs> comfortable shoes for any occasion. Tom Shoes. If, Buy one. If you're listening, away. Tom, please throw us some of that sponsorship <laughs> right. money. Tom Shoes. Hey, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> seriously, uh, check us out on the web. Our website will take you to all your possible podcast listening opportunities and some of our merch. You know, we never talk about our merch. We don't talk about our merch. We have a great logo. Our new one is is in the style of a certain pumpkin show with a Christmas show with it with a comic <laughs> that has a dog that sleeps on top of a a, a, a dog house with a, a kid named Chuck. Anyway, he's bald headed and he's. <laughs> Oh, that's it's in that style. It is not a registered trademark and not any of our business. But anyway, <laughs> if you if you want some really cool merch, we have some merch out there. So yeah, you can go to uh, edutechguys.com and you can click and you the merch button. Merch button. It'll flip you over to the merch side. Flip you over, flip you off. Flip whatever. You. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Edutech Welcome, Guys. That's right. You know, as we get older, this is we're we're we're, we're closing in on ten years, and yeah, so it's crazy. We've lost our minds. It's a little bit of. You know, it's where education, if you're listening to this and you're an educator, you know, we don't have to explain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know exactly right. what's you know, going on. We, you know, and it's so funny. We talk about this, especially with our guests. Uh, I don't know how often we talk about it on the show, but uh, as, as, as we often say, you know, between the two of us, we've got more than 60 years combined of education and specifically education technology experience. That is a lot. We've been here a long time. We are, we're old. And between the two of us, we have like maybe 60 days of like home baking experience between us. <laughs> that's pretty cool, too. I make, that, that's like 59 and a half of you. And I, can got, ma- I can make a mean one of them canned cinnamon rolls with the orange frosting on it. Canned cinnamon rolls. With the orange frosting. Not the, 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 the white frosting, I'm not good at it. The orange frosting ones, you know, I can knock those out. I'm I'm honestly trying to think if I have ever baked anything in my life. I don't know if I have. I'd like to read. I'd, I'd like I'll to, have to. I'll have to defer to my wife on yeah, that I'm, one. I'm going to have to redact that number and say 30 days of <laughs> yeah, combined. <that's> right. <laughs> so, speaking but, of half baked. <laughs> speaking of numbers, uh, today we got a great show on math, and uh, I'm, I'm. It's really interesting. It's a great show on math, and and the, the company that we're. That it's uh, elephant learning, and yeah. uh, uh, Doctor Negrath that's on is um, doc- Doctor of Mathematics. You know, he's been super smart guy. Great book on anxiety in mathematics and overcoming that. And um, if you don't have anxiety in mathematics, I, w- I would. And this is Jeff. I'm going to throw some numbers out here. I, I would guess seventy percent of the country has anxiety, or larger, has anxiety with math. I mean, just it's, thinking it's about probably, it. yeah. I mean, it's it's I, 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 I suddenly feel like we're playing card sharks. I believe that number is higher. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's find out. Oh, David, you whammy. I want to go higher. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, wrong show. Whammy. That's not. Right. <laughs> the password is yeah. algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Think about that. Had the password ever been algebra? Who's? How do I? How do you? How do I do algebra? Trigonometry. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Betty White would have never got that. No. No. She would have slapped me across the room at I, you know, tried to <laughs> act out algebra. 
Like I know Betty White, but I'm telling you, I bet she was a slapper. She'd slap me. She'd knock you into knock next week. <laughs> Especially on Hollywood Pyramid or Pyramid of Money or whatever that is. It does make me wonder if, if folks who are especially Gen X age, as we are, uh, I wonder if we would live longer if our parents hadn't smacked us into next week so often. I wouldn't have math anxiety, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different anxiety, and it's a whole different show. Uh-huh, but So really, it, it's going to be a really cool show. And, it is. And, and you know, when you think about math anxiety, I, I mean, if you ask most adults, hey, I'm going to put you in a room with 30 people, and then you could be randomly called on to answer a math question. Would you be willing to do that? How many people go? I don't want to have, be anywhere near that room. I, I just, I, I seriously just got anxiety. See? I mean, that uh, the thought of that. I was like, mm-hmm. holy crud! And so, I know that was hypothetical. And I'm like, oh, here's no. the crazy part. Now I'm going to say this. Don't. And now, and now we're, we're, hold on a second. Boop. We're going into serious mode. Okay. You know how I say this all the time. I, I've been in a lot of workshops and I've run a lot of workshops. I've yeah. done a lot of conference sessions with ten people or a thousand people. We, we, we've been there. We've done that. And everybody throws out, you know, rubrics and the, the SAS and the TWO and the DIV, and they come out with the acronyms, and they're throwing out all these big words. How many teachers in that room and educators in that room, me included, hear some of this stuff, and, and you're like, yeah, I know what that is. Please don't ask me what that means. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, but and that's an anxiety. Sure. That, that is a, you know, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. Just ask. Mm-hmm. You know, and if the person that you ask goes... <laughs> you don't know what a rubric is, then that person really needs to go home, look in the mirror and question themselves why they're in education. And, and I'll be honest with you, that's not going to happen. Yeah. They're going to go, oh, you know, because every educator, if you're listening to this, you're an educator and a, organically the opportunity arises for you to teach something, mm-hmm. you, you rise to the occasion. Yeah. yeah. Whether it's teaching a three-year-old how to tie their shoe are helping a you know a second year teacher understand rubrics and curriculum and mapping and standards and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, I'm awesome because you know that's a good thing. I'm passing it on. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. So yeah. anyway, boop. Okay, we're out of that serious section. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ooh. starting to get a little claustrophobic for I me. got a little anxious, honestly, from my own voice. <laughs> we, so, we, we all did. Hey, listen, uh, we're going to take a quick second, run out to whatever sponsored ad is on our, our, our podcast host is putting out. Your guess is as good as ours. We need the three cents, so we'll be right back after this. Hey, welcome back to the Edutech guys. Real excited to have our next guest on the show, and we're yeah. going to let him introduce himself, tell us who he is and what he does and all that kind of good stuff. So here we go. Hi, I'm Dr. Aditya Nagraf. I've got a PhD in math computer science from the University of Denver. And uh, basically, I've been running a, a, a math academy for children. On average, children in our system learn about a year and a half of math over the course of 10 weeks when they use our system just 30 minutes per week. Uh, we have a coaching program that is associated with it to help students uh, overcome mathematics anxiety and perform within our system and, and take our take what they're learning in our system outside. Um, and we've turned that into a book, so Treating Mathematics Anxiety. So we just released this book. And uh, actually last week, it, it ended up on the Amazon bestseller list. Uh, That's awesome. In, uh, I think elementary education. That's really that's cool. Awesome. Congratulations on that. I'm gonna, I, I'm, and, and I'm and I'm glad that's kind of where we're gonna jump off into this conversation, or at least that's that, that's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna I'm gonna jump us off into the conversation. jump off into it, my friend. <laughs> it's it's the whole math anxiety because it, that is a big deal. There are so many people that you know. If, if you mention the word math, the very first words out of their mouths are you know, oh, I hate math. I can't do math. Math's not for me. So talk about math anxiety in general. And then specifically, how do you guys, how, how did you come up with this system that helps people, you know, overcome that anxiety about math? Yeah. So basically, uh, what, what we talk about in the book is how, um, how they based artificial intelligence off of uh, uh, basically like what they determined to be intelligence was learning. So, so you have a bunch of inputs. You have a bunch of outputs and you have a function trying to map those inputs to those outputs okay. and then you got a training function well when you look at like what that might be for a human being because like that's kind of what they said they're trying to model it after it the inputs would be our experiences and the outputs would be the meaning that we add to those experiences 
And so like for mathematics or basketball, or if it's an instrument that the student's trying to learn, uh, the basic belief system kind of the meaning kind of boils down to I can do this or I can't do this. And then everything after that kind of becomes a justification to kind of prove to themselves they can do it or they can't do it, which means that they're then creating the reality that they're walking into. So the coach's strategy uh, then has to be to keep the student on the I can side of this. And the reason why this is so important is because like if it's basketball or maybe it's a piano, well, you might find a different instrument or you might find a different sport, right? You're going to find what the kid's interested in and let them do it. But when it comes down to mathematics and reading and writing, that's kind of it. That's the entire game. If you want to be a functional adult, you have to be able to do some of these things. And so, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the premise of the, the program. Cool. So let's talk about how you guys, you got to that. What, what led you to the hypothesis that this was going to work if we, uh, we, we, we follow this path, we go down this rabbit hole, this is what's going to get us to that point. So how did that happen? You know, what was the beginning of this for you and then your, your, your cohorts? How did this happen? Well, so like, uh, I mean, math anxiety is like, uh, if you're getting a PhD in math. Yeah, did, did you have math anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th that's the thing is that like, uh, you're a teacher, you're a math teacher at some point, you're, you're teaching students at some point. Mm -hmm. And then there's also like discussions of like this idea of uh, the enumeracy, the idea that, well, I'm just not a math person, so I just don't have to do it. Um, but like, when you're running a program like what we're running, where we're promising the parent that they're going to learn, that their student's going to learn a year of math over the course of three months if they just use our system 30 minutes per week, and we're guaranteeing that, um, when the parent comes back to us and says, "Yeah, we just can't do this because we don't like the voice," hmm. and this, this like, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> I, I see where you're going, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like, so now it's like, okay, so like, we have to find a way to address this because at the very least, they're coming and telling us that there's a problem. So I'm on the phone with them, and so that's kind of what got the program started. Was that like, yeah, okay, well, first I would start to coach parents, then I taught like uh, our customer success team lead how to do it. So then he was doing it for some time. And then now what we've done is we've developed a coaching program to where you'll meet with a coach 30 minutes uh, twice a month per student included in the subscription. So that like, you know, if, if you're having any challenges at all, just get on the phone with us and we'll, we'll start to talk through it. We'll start to figure out what it is. Yeah. And uh, I mean, look, if it boils down to like coaching practices and then that's where we you know, like we did it, we did our research, we did our, how can we start to work with these things? What do coaches do in basketball? What do coaches do? Uh, uh, just all over, right? Yeah. So the platform, uh, w one of our talking points right here was, you know, gamifying mathematics. So is, is that pretty much the platform we're looking at is to help reduce that anxiety by uh, gamifying a lot of it so that they have these wins, you know, they get these great wins and they, they, they achieve and therefore overcome that anxiety. Well, so the gamification uh, it is like the idea of like, we, we can put a score around it, right? There's a way to measure it. Um, but then it's also the idea that mathematics itself is like a kind of puzzle game. The, mm -hmm. the analogy is think Sudoku, mm -hmm. but it's elementary mathematics. And so like the experiences or the activities that we're providing the student you can consider it to be a puzzle or you can consider it to be the activity that the researchers have already determined to be effective. Or when you look at them, what you begin to realize is that this is the underlying meaning behind uh, the written mathematics. So mm -hmm. like to give you a concrete example, five plus four equals nine. So give me five things. Give me four more things. How many things do I have? And for young students, you can't necessarily do it with things. You have to do it with something a little bit more concrete. So like, here's trains, here's cars, here's sure. whatever object. Yeah. And that's the quote unquote, like gamification. But like, the thing is, is that like a lot of people get caught up 
when they start this process and I have to make it fun. Hmm. And the thing is, is that like, we shied away from that. We shied away to, we have to make it effective. We have to make it so that the hoop is maintained, so to speak. So like, since we've developed the program, the analogy is basketball. So like in basketball, everyone can see, did the ball go in the hoop or not? And with mathematics, it's sort of the same story. And so like, did we build a good basketball hoop is the end of the question. And we think the basketball hoop's good. So then now that's where the coaching kind of steps into, well, look, it's not a big deal if the ball didn't go in the hoop, right? Like if you look at basketball players, they're not making half of their shots. They're not, but like, we're going to get you to that proficiency and you're going to gain the understanding as you do it. Well, and so continuing that the, the basketball analogy then, so if a student is playing a sport, you know, and, and again, we'll just stick with basketball. So they're, they're shooting, they're missing, they're getting coached, they're shooting, they're, maybe they're making a little more, but they're still missing. What, what does that look like? I'm trying to envision what that looks like from, uh, from a, a parent perspective as you're working with the student. So, you know, what, what, what can I expect my child to experience in that analogy, math related? Yeah. So like, the, the five plus four example, right? It, like we start there, give me five things, give me four more things. And like we even start before that because we started counting. So like demonstration of understanding a number is give me four or five things, right? The student's able to slide over four or five, stop on the number we asked for. They're demonstrating that they understand. Mm-hmm. But like we start earlier than that. We start a definition, right? So like, give me one thing or um, here is one thing. Can you click on one? So mm-hmm. can they recognize the numeral? Can they recognize the finger and kind of building it up, right? So like for more advanced things, uh, it might not even look to the parent as though uh, we're doing any teaching because we're building on top of the definitions that had come beforehand. But the student like theoretically gets it, they theoretically progress. We see it over and over and over again. And then again, right, that's where the coaching then comes into play, right? Because what's happening? Is the student experiencing frustration because the the ball didn't go in? Um, Are they saying they can't do it? Are they having a legitimate struggle or misunderstanding that the coach can help them through? And, and we teach the parent also how to do it. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's almost, <laughs> uh, this, this may be a stretch, but in my head, the connection that I'm making is actually, is actually along the lines of Karate Kid, you know, where he's doing the wax on, wax off and sand the floor. And he has no idea what, why am I doing all of this stuff? And then, you know, his coach Miyagi comes in and goes, okay, fine. Show me paint the fence. Show me wax the floor. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Aha, you know, moment. all of a sudden those yeah. things start firing off and it's clicking and, oh, I see why you're having me wax on this particular way or sanding this particular way. Uh, that, that's the connection that I'm making. Mm-hmm. Basketball is not my thing. So, you know. Well, you, you kids of the 80s. I know. So, <laughs> yeah. The best way to think about it is like through the colors. So, mm-hmm. like, um, you can't describe the color red to a student right it's just not possible in the same way i can't describe the idea of more <laughs> mm, right, right right but like they can have the experience of getting more things or, or giving me more things and now that language is there and that idea of more is the same idea as addition and so like it's just just weird uh maybe way of trying to put language around these ideas that are around the student. And it, yeah, like from a perspective of thinking about it, like doing something, it feels a little bit more like a karate kid, mm-hmm. but like, this is where we say, Hey, we teach mathematics as a language. Mm-hmm. So like we're trying to get your student to understand it. Yeah. So in, you know, since the pandemic, when the pandemic hit the ed tech landscape was the door flew open and we were looking at everything and trying to make everything work. Um, we found that a lot of it didn't work. <laughs> well, a lot of it did, and then we started modifying from that. How did you guys address that, overcome that, and what does um, elephant learning bring to the student that's different that really makes makes it work and grows with the child? Yeah, yeah, thank you. For, so this is a, a really good question because there's two things necessary in order to have a student overcome mathematics anxiety. Mm-hmm. 
the first is that you have to believe that they can do it and you have to say to them that I believe you can do it. But the second is then you have to meet them at their level of understanding. So to give you a concrete example, like you can't really understand what multiplication is if you don't understand what addition is because multiplication is repeated addition. So yeah. like, you just had a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if I don't meet them at their level of understanding and I start like, hey, you're in grade three, so you should get this. Well, guess what? I'm proving to them they can't do it. Right. So like no matter how much I say, I believe you can do it, it's not going to work. Um, so like what elephant learning was designed to do, what we what we designed it to do was we actually looked at what is the mathematics problem uh, as far as we could tell. What we learned was that four out of five students start kindergarten unprepared for the kindergarten curriculum, meaning they don't understand what the number 10 is. So if you say, give me 10 things, they're not able to slide over 10 things. They might just keep going. Mm -hmm. And kindergarten apparently starts at counting to 20. So they're supposed to understand counting to 10. Mm -hmm. And four out of five students along income lines, they they don't have that. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is that uh, for whatever reason, we don't tend to hold these students back. Maybe we don't recognize it. Maybe we Maybe we do recognize it, but like, you know, the research says that holding these students back causes challenges, uh, most likely due to social, uh, yeah, social, social reasons. Stigma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so like the thing is, though, that like it causes these situations where in low income neighborhoods, uh, students are three years behind their funded peers. So that means then that you have students in third grade learning multiplication with an understanding of numbers that rivals a kindergartner. Mm -hmm. So they don't have that addition. So this is an impossible situation for both the third grade teacher and that student. And so like our job, as we saw it was, we have to be able to identify that level, that level of understanding of the student very, very quickly. So within 30 minutes, our placement exam is able to find that level. And, uh, after that, we have to be able to build them back up to be able to communicate with the teacher in the classroom very, very quickly. So we've actually seen in our system this particular uh, use case where like a student might be coming in. They were a, a, a refugee student in Oklahoma. And so like maybe there was English language problems. So they, they kind of tested in at like the three, four year old level, very quickly got to the six, seven year old level. So like whether it was language and they just caught up or whether they just answered incorrectly very quickly we adapt to the student and then from there you see they gain traction so then with a week or two they're at six seven years old they ended up at nine years old and that was a nine-year-old student so that within within 13 weeks that's the recovery scenario that we want to see happen and it's not uncommon uh, especially for students to catch up because they've had all these mathematical experiences in class now that they have that underlying understanding of what is the concrete representation that's happening, well, all of those experiences suddenly make sense. Mm -hmm. And so like they're very, very quickly able to uh, now participate in class. They go from hating math class to loving math class. And, you know, to be honest with you, that's what we mean when we say our mission is to empower children with mathematics. Yeah, that's really cool. So. What, there's so many questions I have, and I know we don't have all the time in the world. But the cool thing I like is, you know, a year's worth of learning in three months, 10 weeks. So um, that means if I get on this program, I can learn string theory in like a decade. <laughs> I, no, I was <laughs> Elementary math. It, it, it's elementary math. <laughs> oh, for, for Jeff, that's string theory. So uh, yeah. <laughs> that's my anxiety with math. No, um, so it's interesting what we're talking about. You know, what we see... Public education is very interesting because parents, they think that they, and, and this doesn't matter if they're from an urban area of poverty or wealth, I drop them off, I pick them up, they have the right clothes, they have the right bags, you guys do the rest of it. And so you guys actually talk to parents and go, hey, we need to bring our children up to this level. I guess my next question is, what's the role of the parent in this? And how do you guys address that? Like, okay, we're going to do this for your child and this is what our site does and this is what our ed tech will do. But you have to do this because just the fact we're telling them that we believe in you and that's the only place they see it. How do you guys handle is, is there a parent program that you guys have or I mean, what's the parent's responsibility inside this this program? Right. So we assumed uh, that they that they wouldn't take a lot of responsibility. The system's mm -hmm. kind of automated, but it's not automatic. 
So like where situations uh, might be going awry, our system actually detects it and emails them instructions on what they could be doing. But it boils down to some conversations. And the main one is the why method. So like if a student is answering something incorrectly, so they're misunderstanding something in the system, mm -hmm. and it's typically a language misunderstanding. So like what we tell them is let them answer incorrectly, don't try to correct them, and then ask them why they think that's the right answer. And typically you're gonna find out where the misunderstanding is happening. So like a good example was like, I was talking with one of these parents and they said, well, uh, so there's these questions that the student was getting where there's two columns worth of stuff. And it says, which one has more? And then the follow-up question was, how many more does, uh, does that one have? And so like, she says, well, he's answering 13 because the column with 13 uh, has 13 or was the one with more. So like, the column with more had 13 in it, so that's why he was answering 13. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, he's not understanding then the idea of how many more, right? Like that this actually means the difference. Yeah. And so if you just kind of make that more concrete for him, and that's what she did, right? So like they're they're experiencing success with this why method. Like the whole hard part was coming up with the concrete example because the first person we told the why method to, she came back and she said, you taught me how to teach my kid math. This is amazing. And I was right. like, I don't know what to tell people still. <laughs> See, and you know, it's funny when you were talking earlier about, you know, kindergartners need to know how to count from one to 20. Well, do you know how many kids know they can count to one to 20, but they're discounting from one to 20. They, they don't know anything about what those are just words. Yes. Out so I, I had a sys admin that worked for me and his little brother was homeschooled and he counted one, two, four. Because they would say, okay, count from, from one through four, one, two, four. And he would go one, two, four. I counted one, two, four. That's the word three. Well, it's one, two, four. That's what you, yes, I get that. And it's funny that if you get the parents on board, that, that doesn't that help sustain um, the student success, you know, throughout the thing once they're, you know, I, a parent that really embraces, hey, I get these great emails. I understand what I'm doing. That's just going to sustain the learning moving forward, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing is that, like, if the student has people around them that believe they can do it, then they also will start to believe they can do it, especially if they're seeing the performance. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, yeah, like, if you see the ball go in the hoop, you believe you can play basketball. Well, that's kind of what it is. And, and, and you know, there's the, the, the sustainability of the whole thing is, is multifaceted. It can't just be one thing. And I see you guys are covering up you know, every aspect of that as it moves forward. It's what it, it sounds yeah. like to me, so... What so you gonna say, David? The, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, the interesting thing with this basketball analogy uh -huh. is it also helps out with this, uh, with with like this, uh, this thing that parents are doing. So, like, when we're trying to jump in and we're trying to help the student or answer for the student, or and I mean, it's not every situation, but like, especially in our system, it's true. But like, when you're doing it on paper, like, obviously, if they're executing a process or something, you might want to help. But like, um. The idea is, is that in basketball, you can't shoot for the student. It's just impossible to do. You can give them tips. You can give them pointers. You can, you know, hold your arm here, right? But at the end of the day, the student has to shoot for themselves. Mm -hmm. But if you imagine a situation where, like, somehow the coach could shoot for the student and did, right? And you, you so as the student, you're seeing the coach put the ball in the hoop. Well, you don't believe that you can play basketball. You believe they can play basketball. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly kind right. kind of lost on that whole thing. Yes. So I've got a question, We and we've kind of talked about this off and on throughout this conversation. You know, we talk about when the teacher's working with the student and when parents are working with the students. So help help our listeners understand, help me understand, when, at, at what point and, and how do 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 does a particular person in this process like find you guys you know what i mean like like is it is it the teacher who says hey i've got this student and so they reach out is it a parent who says hey my kid is having a tough time in math and so they reach out because you know we've kind of covered both bases but i i don't I, I'm, What's I'm the curious. referral model? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, basically. Yeah, I mean, how, how do people? Yeah, who, who how do normally find comes to? Yeah, that, what's the, yeah, well, do, yeah, but I don't, and I don't necessarily mean that literally. You know, oh, you go to elephantlearning.com. I, I get that, but yeah, but who generally is making those referrals? And, yeah, and, so and, and we've what been does helping that a lot of parents. Like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we've been helping a lot of parents uh, mainly, and and they they've typically found us through Facebook or Google. Sure. And uh, I we've started with classrooms, uh, so now uh, very soon we're going to be in the Clever Library. So probably by the time this thing comes out, we will Bingo. hopefully be certified. Yeah. And once we're in the Clever Library, I think it'll be easier for these teachers to work with us because sure. we're going to be able to suck in their students immediately. So like they're just up and running immediately. Yeah. And um, and but like we're, we've been working with uh, I don't even know how many like it was 50 a year ago, uh, some classrooms, 50 some classrooms slash schools. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, right now it's typically the parent finding us. Sure. But more and more teachers are starting to find us uh, and and hopefully use us in the classroom. Oh, yeah, well, that's why you do these these kind of podcasts and stuff too, because it's get the word out that we both work for public education, so you know, we've been doing it for sixty years combined. So yeah, this is this is the way you make it happen. So I I, I have a question that's that's just about math and it's just about what we're doing in education. So elementary teachers are, are, are really interesting um, individuals. They are kind of the Swiss Army knives of education. They teach an hour on mathematics. They teach an hour on writing. They teach an hour on social studies, an hour on history. You, you get where I'm going at. And no one can be a, uh, a be, they can be a jack of all trades, but they can't be a master of all of them. So how do you guys look, how do you personally, how do you look at if I'm an elementary teacher and I'm a, I'm a great second grade teacher, but I do also have math anxiety. So I take that into in front of the class. And so my math anxiety, even though I hide it possibly very well, it's still there. And so don't you think that would affect the teaching of math um, to my classroom that I as an educator have a little bit of math anxiety? And how would you guys see overcoming that? Right. So, like, uh, the book, uh, Treating Math Anxiety, the, the exercises in it uh -huh. were designed to help someone basically kind of overcome their anxieties. It, it's just designed to bring your belief system to the forefront because once it's kind of in front of you, now you can kind of see it and you can start to say, well, do I want to yeah. do this? And, like, what are the stories that, like, brought that up? And then, like, stories that, like, uh, of, of you overcoming things. Yeah. So, like, one of the techniques that we might talk about in the book is gestalt. Gestalt, is, like, it's not, like, a, I, I don't know, it's a weird term because, mm -hmm. like, I got it from, like, the entrepreneur people, mm -hmm. and they're not using it the way the psychology people are using it per se, but, like, they meant it as experience share. Can I share an experience of a time that I overcame some sort of a challenge as an example of, like, yeah, challenges can be overcome. And so like then that, like, yeah, okay, well, if I invest the time in math, I could probably learn it is like the conclusion that people will draw to themselves. Um, but yeah, like the effect, uh, I mean, if you're kind of like uh, in your triggered zone, yeah. you're gonna leave out information, you're gonna forget things. That, and so like that that kind of thing ends up making it more confusing maybe for the, for the people around you or in the classroom or whatever. Yeah. So like that that's kind of the the downside of it. But like one of the ways that elephant learning kind of helps uh, the teacher is that we're providing um, teacher training at the student's level. So like if you have the third grade teacher with the student who's working at the kindergarten level, they may have received conceptual math training at the third grade level, but they didn't receive it at the kindergarten level or the first grade. So like we detect where the student is and we're feeding them those videos and we're also feeding those to the parents yeah. so that like if they want to just watch the video and like try the exercise themselves, like they get an idea of what the student's working on. Cool. Now they're able to speak with them and work with them and they feel very comfortable. Yeah. Well, that I, I was trying to bring it back to the book because I knew, you know, teachers like to have a good list of books to keep in their in their repertoire. And this sounds like one of those books that they need to put in that stack to, you know, go ahead. Hey, I'm going to use this because the techniques in it aren't just about math. You can replace it with reading or anything else. It's a, it's a technique to yeah. overcome that anxiety. So I want to make sure we got that book back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, you know, my, my wife uh, was mostly a, a literacy teacher for a long time at this point and and uh, a, a literacy facilitator and so she has recently gone back to the classroom in elementary school and of course as you mentioned you know she's got a you know swiss army knife this thing and, and one of the things she's got to teach is math and she has 
pretty high math anxiety. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, <laughs> sorry, I, I don't know how this is going to come off. I, I don't mean she to doesn't do, listen to but, this. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not worried about that part. But, and but this is, this is going, the challenge is if I have math anxiety and the student doesn't understand me, mm-hmm. am I questioning myself? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, and that's what I was going to say. I, you know, I mean, don't we always do that first, too? You know, I'm going to get I'm, I'm going to get this book for her because yeah. I know She'll I, 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 I yeah, or or not. I mean, you know, she may well, she may love the book and not me, but it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. She may be like, what are you doing with this? No, uh, no but but seriously, I, you know, I, I think anytime you can give somebody a tool to to either a help them themselves or a tool that they in turn are able to use to to have someone else help themselves, right? Uh, then it, it's a win win, right? Well, and, 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 and just to, just to throw in there, you know, elephantlearning.com. I love the fact that I'm a second grade teacher. I've got I've got some kids struggling. I get the parents on board. I get the student on board. Thirty minutes into it, we know that this is what the student needs. They're catching up, and within three months, that student is either caught up or surpassed the other students in my class, which let the other parents know, hey, which in turn lets my principal know and my school mm-hmm. district know, hey, we need to put this in place because this is a great assessment tool to get us to where we need to go. And then beyond assessment, it is a is a learning tool that's going to get the job done. So, so having said that, if folks want to find out more, what's the best way they can get in touch with you guys? I mean, you know, if you want to, please tell us the, the title of the book again and everything, and then uh, especially about elephant learning. Sure. So the title of the book was uh, Treating Mathematics Anxiety, uh, Inclusive Strategies for Working with Students Exhibiting Mathematics Anxiety. And uh, it's on Amazon, Audible, uh, Kindle. Yep. Uh, and uh, you can find out more about Elephant Learning at elephantlearning.com. Cool. If you're in the school system, schools.elephantlearning.com. That was created for you. And, um, yeah, like we'll be looking forward to speaking with you. Cool. And uh, if they want to search your name, tell us again one more time for the listeners. Dr. Aditya Nagrath. Uh, you'll find me on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. Oh, cool. Cool. And we'll have the uh, information in the description of the podcast itself. So, yeah. Dr. DeGrath, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really been a great the time. It was a lot of fun. Been a great conversation. Awesome. Hey, I want to thank Dr. DeGrath once again, elephantlearning.com. Don't forget to check out his book. Go to Amazon. Hey, you, you, you heard him say it. Made the Amazon top list. That's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, bestseller list. That's awesome. Shoot. Heck yeah. And it sounds like if you're an educator, if you're a parent, heck, if you're just looking for a way to um, jump into the gestalt and get away, get get rid of your anxiety. It sounds like it's a book that's worth reading because we all have an anxiety in the learning area somewhere. Yeah. You know, whether it's taking a new job and having to learn what you're going to do with that new job. So this is not just a book about math anxiety, which it is, but it's also techniques and strategies to help you overcome those anxieties. So yeah. I think that'd be really cool. But uh, software sounds great. Uh, the the company sounds awesome. So please do check them out. Don't you think? Yeah. Check them out, man. Awesome. Hey, listen, uh, it's been a great show. I've had a great show. Yeah, we've had fun. It's fun. It's been great. It's a hoot talking with him. I, really intelligent people give me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I do like that he was able to break down some of those you know, oh, deeper concepts. Completely. You know, and especially the fact that they relate it to you know basketball, the, which a lot of people... Completely. Uh, you know, yeah. the, at least you have a basic understanding of, of basketball. As he said, you know, ball goes in hoop. Okay. That's you can the, see it. That's the premise there it is. of yeah. getting over your math anxiety. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like, wait, what? I feel like you missed something. No, the ball goes in the hoop. Here's math. Four plus nine. Oh. Oh, wait. It kind of reminds me of the scene in Big where the kid's having trouble with his algebra homework. Uh-huh. And so uh, Tom Hanks, you know, they go up to the bedroom. And uh, he's like, you know, so if they score, you know, if, if they score whatever it was, you know, six points in the first quarter, how many points are they going to score in the game? And he's like, well, they're going to score, you know, 24 points. And he goes, yes, well, possibly, but that's algebra. And the kid's like, wait, what? He goes, hey, you just did algebra. You did six points times four quarters. You know, you did the six X times four. They're going to score roughly. You know, and, and to me, that's that yeah. kind of, it's, it's the same kind of thing. You know, you just, you have to find something to relate it to and make it make sense. Oh, my gosh. I just learned. I, I saw Big 300 times. I just learned algebra. And I thought we were going to the big piano. No. Anyway. <laughs> hey, it's been a great show. I'm Jeff Madlock. Uh, I'm David Henderson. We'll get you next time. You've been listening to the EduTech Guys. EduTechGuys.com. <laughs>